Thank you. Um, yeah, so I will talk today a little bit about um, spike sorting and why we need it to be power efficient. And also I will talk about why we need online learning for embedded hardware accelerators to actually have good spike sorting. So, but let's first talk about, okay, yeah. Let's first talk about why do we need actual brain computer interfaces. So, most of the reason is that people are actually suffering, or patients are, where we could increase the life quality for patients that are either suffering from Parkinson with tremors, they could also um, have retinopathia pigmentosa and go blind, or they could actually be paralyzed. For all those things, if we have a brain computer interface, we can actually help them increasing their life quality. For example, we could reduce the tremors for people that have Parkinson. But what kind of technologies do we have? So, first of all, one very easy technology is EEG, or not easy, but it's the easiest to apply because we can actually have electrodes outside of our brain. The problem is, or the good part is, let's start with the good part. The good part is we can actually measure everything from outside of the brain, and we measure a sum signal, so we know in which brain region um, our brain is actually working more and in which regions it doesn't work um, or where more brain activity is or less brain activity but it's still some signal um, then we have ECOG this is inside of your head but out in the outer side of your brain so it's applied there it's two, um, 25 times 25 millimeters big so we have a very a relative small area that we can look at but um, we still are measuring a sum signal so we can know a little bit more fine granular which areas are active and which are not. And then there are invasive multi-electrode arrays. This one is one from BlackRock. It's called BlackRock Utah Array. It has 69 electrodes. It's four times four millimeters big. And um, there we can, act this one is actually an invasive technology where we put it inside of your brain. So it's, it will be basically plucked from the outside of your brain a little bit inside, so that those um, well, is this one working? Yeah. So that these little um, knots are actually inside. The thing is, we're still measuring a sum signal. So if there are multiple neurons around it, we will not know which neuron has fired. And to detect which neuron is actually sending or firing, um, this this process is called spike sorting. Um, a typical spike sorting pipeline or neural processing pipeline can look like this. First, I want you to just focus on the upper part. So what we have is, first, we have our electrodes in, inside of your brain, and then we would use a pre-amplifier and digitize those signals. This will s somehow look like this graph here. Um, out of this graph, we would typically use a spike detection, um, to detect those spikes. This is usually done by applying a threshold. There are multiple techniques to do that, but the easiest one is actually using a threshold. You can also compute some or do some math and apply a threshold then. But um, yeah, those, those are the typical techniques. Um, yeah, and from those thresholds, we actually will cut out some spikes. They can look like this here. Um, but to actually do good spike sorting, we want to have the spikes aligned. So, as you can see, we have more than 60 frames here. Um, at 20 kilohertz or 25 kilohertz, we would actually need like 50, 48 frames, something like that. So we would crop the, um, the signals that we measured, and we would align that it's such that the highest point of the waveform is always at the same time point. And this is probably the 16th time frame, so here all the frames have their highest peak. Out of that, we can actually, when we detect a spike, we would actually extract some features. There are multiple techniques for it. Some are principal component analysis, um, but principal component analysis is widely used, but it's not, um, it's an offline technique. It's not online capable. Uh, and it would actually require a huge overhead. Um, but we could also use some auto encoder, for example, to extract those features. So some did that before here and showed that. And out of those features, we would actually then apply a clustering. And um, the clustering can be used for two things, or, or the, the res result of the clustering can be used for two things. First, we will um, give an output to the neural decoder pipeline, uh, which will actually then detect some 
or try to find some correlations and find out which, um, which ambition the patient had. So this will, in the time domain, it will look like this, that we only have a spike tick, which says, okay, this neuron fired at this time point. Um, however, what we also have are mean waveforms, that one you can see down here, um, where we then actually know how the actual spikes look like. The reason why they look different is usually, so there are different types of neurons, but the most important difference why the waveform looks different is that the spikes are actually, or the neurons are actually more for, further away from the electrode. So this is the only difference. Um, what you can also see, if we apply those pipeline, we actually can reduce the data reduction. So before we have a signal that's continuous, and we would measure that for each electrode, afterwards we would just have some spike ticks. The reason why we need that, or the reason why it's good, is because um, we actually have a problem when we want to send out every data out of the brain. So people would, or if we have like 69 electrodes with 7-bit digitized at 20 kilohertz, we have roughly uh, 36 megabits. And if we want to send that out, we would just need 712 microwatt. The problem is our brain is capable of absorbing 277 microwatt per square millimeter without damaging it. So we need either a rather big chip to send it out, um, or we would damage the brain. Those are our two options. And if we would apply spike sorting on an implant, then we would actually reduce the data rate so much that we can um, reduce the sending cost. However, this only makes sense if our spike algorithms are such power efficient that we would actually, um, or that the um, reduced sending costs are higher than the um, cost that we applied through an implant spike sorting. But this is one part. There are still some problems. Um, spike sorting, there are actually four problems that are very significant. First one is called neuron drift. So I told you that the waveform changes, or the waveform is dependent on the, um, on the distance to the electrode and also a little bit on how the uh, shape of your brain is. But, um, but uh, due to the electrode moving a little bit, the waveform changes. So we could not apply, or we cannot apply techniques that are just trained once and will never change. We have to have some adaption for uh, long-term changes in the waveform. The second, second thing is that we could have bursting neurons. Bursting neurons are neurons that um, are actually sending way more often than we would expect. Usually spikes are around two milliseconds long, and then they would refactor for another two milliseconds. When we have bursting neurons, it might happen that they send way more often and don't have this refactoring period. The problem is, at some point, the at least energy of the um, the energy of the neuron will go down over the time, so the actual waveform will be smaller and smaller and smaller, and you have multiple ones behind that. So the good part is we can actually detect that because we have a very high amount, a very high number of spikes in a very short time, but um, we still need some algorithm to tackle that problem. The third one is actually the most complicated one. Those are overlapping spikes, so it could actually be that two neurons fire at the same time point. And if we have that, um, then we would actually need to have this mean waveform that I showed you before and do some cross-correlation, so or autocorrelation. And we shape all those over together, and then we would be able to detect those multiple clusters. And the last one, uh, new neurons could, uh, uh, could be created by your brain or they could actually die. So we either have new clusters or we have to remove old clusters. Um, and therefore, for all of those problems, we need a power-efficient adaptive algorithm. So I told you that we want to have it at par as power-efficient as possible. And one technique that does that very well, which is not adaptable it's by itself, but reconfigurable for the inference, is called salient feature selection. The idea behind salient feature selection is that we, for some reason, know the mean waveform of those spikes, and then we try to find those points for each new unit that distinguishes the spikes most. For example, for the green unit, the, this time point, time in, uh, point in time, sorry, this point in time 
distinguishes this spike most from the others and also this point in time. So for each unit that we ha detec have detected, we will have two, uh, two samples that we would look at. For those two samples, we would try to find a window of values that are um, in the range, and if both values are in this range, we would say it's neuron one, neuron two, whatever. The cool part is that this inference module would have actually a very simple pipeline. We would have an electrode, we digitize, this, digitize it, we have a spike detection and an alignment, and then we would just select the 13th and the 17th frame, for example, a sample, sorry, not frame, sample, and um, look if, the value, if both values are inside of the, my window that I have configured before. So if I would apply this for an implant, this would actually allow me to have way more um, um, electrodes inside of my brain, or the amount of electrodes could be very high without reaching the power limitations. The thing is, we need something to configure it, and that's called a shadow spike sorter. Um, we would actually try to send out some spikes, so a sparse representation of old spikes, not every spike, because this would actually damage the brain, uh, or be too much, because we need some sending costs, or we have some sending costs, but we would rather send a sparse representation for each channel at some point, and we would buffer them. And if we have buffered them, then we have a shadow spike sorter who would actually do the spike sorting part, He's, and out, out of the um, shadow spike sorter, there will, can come two things. First, we could adapt the threshold for the spike detection because we, there's actually some techniques that we're trying to investigate right now um, on detect if, the, if it's an actual spike or if it's just noise that we detected. Um, and therefore, we could adapt the um, threshold for the spike detection. And the sec second thing is that we have then this mean waveform and then we can apply the salient feature selection optimizer to find out which frames we have, uh, which samples we want to actually look at and how those windows look like. For the shadow spike sorter, I personally would like to implement an um, autoencoder and some clustering. Um, and the reason why I personally prefer to have it on an FPGA is because it's very, it can be, or can do a lot of computations, but it's also very power efficient. And it doesn't have to change the, we, we don't have to change it that often, but we could change it. And the shadow spike sort of is a device that we would usually then wear uh, next to us. So it's a wearable device. We have limited battery capacity at some point, but it's not that limited as in the brain. So to give you an understanding about why the FPGA might be a good fit for it, um, I will first give you some information about how the FPGA works. So inside of an FPGA, or the hardware accelerator, we have those important units that are called CLB, or configurable logic blocks. Those are actually some circuits that contain lookup tables and um, flip-flops, which are one-bit registers. The important magic that happens is that each of those configurable logic blocks has a lot of wires around it, which can be connected to the lo logic block. Due to the way we wire those logic blocks together, we can actually have some circuits that implement our um, algorithm, but since it's an electronic circuit, it's very fast. Um, one problem that we have is that we, are tip or we would typically not use the, or have the switch matrix for ourselves to come um, or, or not by ourselves, but we would not um, configure the switch matrix by ourselves, but we would rather use a program like Chao said yesterday, he used Vivado for that. And uh, this is just a proprietary software um, for Xilinx FPGAs or AMD FPGAs um, to configure them. Um, yeah. When we want to train the neural network, we could usually decide between different data types. Um, Usually, when we talk about power-efficient neural networks, most people would first think of using integer. The reason why integer might be a bad idea and floating point might be a better idea is that weights typically behave uh, or are distributed like a Gauss distribution. This is just an example from one CNN that I trained a few weeks ago, but I think you will see that trend in multiple um, 
in multiple CNNs or in multiple neural networks. Um, so what we have is actually a distribution around, around the value zero, and floating point has actually a relative error, and integer has an absolute error. This, is, this wouldn't be a problem um, if this distribution would look a little bit different, but since most of the weights are near zero, we don't want to quantize them to, let's say, even if it's fixed point, we want them like to be, uh, or to have a relative error, let's say it like that. And therefore we could use floating point. But floating point, people say that it's computational so expensive. So why should we actually do that? Well, there are techniques to reduce the bit width of floating point. Floating point, at least usually in normal precision, has 32 bits, even in half precision, 16 bits. But there are people that developed, for example, Minifloat, which is actually an 8-bit or less um, data type. So the first bit is used for the sign. So far, OK, um, or so far, so good. Then you would usually have an exponent, which has the number of bits you want, and you would have a mantissa. Um, in this case, this would mean that the exponent is 9, and the mantissa is one uh, is one eight, but the thing that you might not know is that the mantissa is not the only value because you would have an the mantissa is just everything behind the comma and before the comma there's a one, that's not written anywhere, but it's an assumption that people or that's actually an IEEE standard for normal floating points so it's just used in this case. So this value would be two to the power of nine. Um, minus b, this is called the bias, because we would, in this case, not have a negative exponent, um, and therefore people would usually use a bias. Um, and the bias then itself um, is usually symmetric. The reason why it's symmetric was because it's very easy to compute, but we could, we could actually, when we use Minifloat, make it adaptive and asymmetric. Um, the reason why we want to have it asymmetric is because the values in the forward pass, so the absolute values in the forward pass for the exponent, are usually not that much distributed and a little bit um, higher than the gradients that we have in the backward pass. So what you can see here is that the gradients in the backward pass are much more distributed and also much, more, uh, much smaller than the um, actual values. For that, we could actually use um, a so-called technique called block minifloat. What block minifloat does is that we can have a bias that is stored inside of the tensor um, for the whole tensor and use that to uh, shift the range of the values for this tensor. So we could actually apply that for one convolution, we could apply it for even one channel inside of the convolution, we could apply it for the whole network. And also we can apply this for the backward pass and so on. So when people are computing neural networks on an FPGA, they would usually have two different architectures. Either they, they try to build a general multiplication matrix which is called GAM, or they try to compute the stuff in layer. Um, the GEMM, or GAM, on FPGAs um, would implement a very high efficient mul mul matrix multiplication unit, but the problem is that the routing of the layers or the architecture of the neural network has to be done by something else, or it could also be inside of the FPGA. So we could either do, use it with an MCU or SOC or we just uh, use the FPGA itself to route all these layers. But we have a very high data transfer to the general matrix multiplication unit, and then the, re the results will be put back, and so on and so forth. And the data transfer is actually the part that is limiting the FPGA's fre maximum frequency. So what we could do instead is use in-layer computation. And the cool part is that we would actually compute in parallel. So we don't have this one unit that is computing everything at once, or not everything at once, but at least one layer at once, or one matrix at once, but we could do that for each layer. And um, my assumption is that in-layer computations um, are feasible when we find a good trade-off between area and latency. So for example, we have two layers, 
And the first one we needs 25 cycles to be computed because there are more neurons. And the second one needs 10 cycles to be computed. What we could do instead, if we have some small multiplication units, we could actually try to find a good fit where we have, for example, two multiplication units inside of the layer, and therefore increasing the parallelization because now the latency of this whole network is rather uh, 23 cycles than before the 20, uh, 35 cycles. Um, however, this comes with a trade-off. The trade-off is that we need another unit to compute something. So we could, for the full low latency mode, have a multiplication unit for each input and each weight and have a sum um, operation that is doing the summation all at once. The other way would be to, for a low, low area to have a multiplication unit that is basically shifted or the input is shifted over this multiplication unit and we sum that up with an adding module. Both are totally fine and totally valid methods and we still have to distinguish which one is the best. The reason why I think, another reason why I think um, we could use Minifloat for this kind of computation is that the lookup tables of an FPGA actually have six inputs. So one thing that we could do instead of having the 8-bit for an integer, where we, would, we couldn't do that with um, lookup tables, we could, but for um, the multiplication of floating points, we could actually multiply the mantises with each other, and then we could subtract or add the exponents with each other. And actually this could help us because we could then have one 6-bit lookup table for one mantissa output bit and one 6-bit lookup table for one exponent output bit. Obviously, we need more output bits, but in this case, it are maxi at maximum six output bit bits for the mantissa, and um, I think six output bits for the exponent. And finally, this, if we apply all those things, could help us to have a very fully parallelizable um, neural network training on the FPGA, where we would have multiple layers, that are all computed at once. So each role is actually computed at the same time point. And as you can see, we have like uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, actually eight computations at the same time. We could then have an eight times of throughput. Um, the thing why I would not say, or why I wouldn't update the weights all the time is that we would usually do that over a mini batch and then we would update the weights afterwards. So what we actually induce when we use this kind of method is an overhead in the latency. Um, what people are doing for the precision training or, or for precision in on-device training are either they apply or they store high weights, then they quantize them in the forward pass, they have still high activation functions or high precision activation functions, and they would also compute the backward pass in, in a high um, precision. This would actually, or is actually useful because we would um, reduce the computational expensivity uh, for the inference. The second thing that we could do is we could also have the weights in a low bit resolution. So we would actually need less memory for the weights and don't have to quantize them every time when we are doing an inference. The third thing that people are doing is applying the quantization scheme also for the activation function. But what almost no people are doing is quantizing the backward pass. And this is the last row. And this is actually where I want to look at. Um, the reason why people are not doing that is because the gradients are at some point so small that we will actually, when we quantize them further, we'll reduce them to zero. So if they are reduced to zero, zero no update will happen and we will actually never train. Therefore, um, I want in the future to investigate um, parallel processing for the online training. I want to build those gradient computations for specific layers with a specific loss function and integrate that in our creator tool, Elastic AI creator tool. Therefore, I obviously need to investigate some optimization techniques for the backward pass. And finally, one thing that we could do is to investigate when to use external RAM instead of the block RAM on the chip, because for, lay, compute, um, sorry, for neural networks that are very big, we need to store the inputs of each layer um, for a long time, so it could make actually sense to use the RAM that we have on our Elastic node. And finally, 
the paper that I'm right now working on, um, we want to actually um, use the gradients that are very low, uh, and then we com uh, compute the mean. And out of that, we would then try to apply a binomial distribution um, with the same uh, mean value as the gradient. But if we train a lot of times, then we would actually have some changes in the weights without um, reducing the gradient always to zero. So that's the idea here. We're still investigating it. First, first results are like, it could work. We have not seen some big errors, but uh, yeah. I, these are only preliminary, pre preliminary results. And finally, coming to my conclusion. So I hope you learned that adaptive spike sorters are important uh, for on implant, but they, and, uh, but they are not feasible. So we want to actually have configurable, uh, configurable spike sorter for on implant. The adaptation needs to come from outside. The second thing is you hopefully learned that salient feature selection is very scalable and very scalable approach for brain computer interfaces or spike sorting, and that we could use deep learning for a shadow spike sorter. Um, regarding the online training part, um, you saw that the um, mini float could be a good option for FPGA computing, and that gradients that can be too small or that gradients can be too small for computation. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention and hope you have any questions. Okay, um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I, I was always wondering, <laughs> Where do you get the data from? Because, you know, <laughs> I am also working with uh, uh, brain-computer interfaces, yeah. but uh, we use the EEG approach, mm -hmm. which is less invasive. But we have problems getting the data because you have to have a constant... Uh, when, you, when you work with, uh, with, yeah. with human beings. Yeah. And this is invasive, so it's, yeah. it's much more critical. Uh, the, Definitely. The, the, how, how, how do you get the... <laughs> um, having a professor that has some contacts and applying for a research project helps a lot because having a professor that is applying for a project and having some partners that are actually doing those, method, uh, those recordings um, so we are working with the Ruhr Universität Bochum together, and the, there, there is a professor that did some recordings during his PhD, and those data sets we can actually use. Yeah, it's not like the idea you would have maybe some existing pool of... Uh, yeah, we, we have a lot of data, but to be fair, they are, we are not sure how good the data are. I think that's still a major problem in spike sorting itself, because they are not a lot open data sets. They are even less when we talk about movement ambitions, for example. So this is one thing we want to try in our project to detect the movement ambition. But there are actually almost no data sets. And I think there are also no available or public available data sets. So you actually have to know someone who's doing something, and then they might give it to you. Um, right now, we are also trying to cooperate with someone from Aachen, who's also um, doing this invasive technologies, but he's doing that with, not with humans, but with mice. So that might also be a thing for us in the future. But yeah, getting the data set is always the problem. And also, even the experts aren't sure which one is a spike and which is not. So it's not even like they can provide us ground truth. We have some things in the data set that have ground truth, but I wouldn't rely on that. Actually, not a, not a question, just an addition to that. The problem is also that so when, usually when this stuff is implanted, there's, there's a medical reason, right? It's not for science. It's most of the time it's, it's more like you, you implant it, you try to measure some effect in the brain to determine what's, what's the cause of some illness, and then after a very, very short time, they remove it again. So, 
this is one thing, and also they, for example, the Utah error that I showed you, the long term, in long term, those are not stable. So they yeah. would actually leave that inside of the brain. So in that regard, um, and measure a few months later, but what they see is that the cells near the array are basically dying, and the responses that we get are smaller, 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 and also a lot of patients die. But I, you, you have to say it like that. Those, those areas are not good. There are other areas that are right now investigated in the USA, but um, the Utah area itself is not long-term stable. To be fair, those patients that get those are very, very sick and try to get something out of their life at that point. So, yeah. But that, that actually means that also these effects where it moves over time. Yeah. It's where many times you don't really, you don't have data to actually see that. Yeah. Because it's not in there long enough. So we actually work with a lot of synthesized data sets, with synthetical data sets. Um, and we hope they are correct. Let's say it like that. <laughs>